Going. Tell people who you are. And what you're All right. Trying. How's it going, guys? Um, I'm Grant Alvis. Um, the last live I did, it's been a little while, but the uh, you might remember me from the last one I did was uh, snakehead flies. That's another one of my favorite fish to target. Today, I'm uh, going to focus more on my other favorite fish to target, and that's the redfish. And specifically, we're going to be tying the crab flies for them. It's, you know, redfish flies kind of span tons of different things. You've got uh, crabs, shrimp, a lot of bait fish flies like clousers and game changers and sliders and stuff like that. But uh, some of my favorite flies to tie for them are these kind of hybrid crabby shrimpy patterns. Um, one that I've kind of mashed up over the years, probably four or five patterns to begin with, all kind of blended together to become this one. It just kind of took all the things I liked out of each one of them and then tweaked them. And this is probably about the third or fourth final, final uh, product of mashing them all together. But um, is this guy, we posted a picture of it to uh, promote the live. Doesn't really have a name yet. Just a really suggestive, buggy, crabby looking pattern. Um, got a weed guard so you don't have to be too afraid of throwing it in the grass beds or um, around grass edges, which a lot of the fish we catch here in Virginia, um, especially on low tide, they don't really get up super shallow, but they'll cruise the grass edges and you'll see them swimming right down the lines. So weed guards, very helpful with that. But um, time in a variety of colors. You got the, what I call the natural blue crab color, blue tipped legs and a little bit of blue hue in the body, as you can see. Then uh, probably my next favorite color is a uh, blurple. The black and purple blend. You've got a uh, black with purple flash in the in the body, and then the uh, black and purple legs as well. Another real popular color is olive. Uh, the The main thing this imitates is a fiddler crab, but the cool thing about our Virginia redfish, most of them are migratory. So you've got a lot of fish that come from as far south as southern South Carolina. So these fish do eat a lot of shrimp in their lifetime. Not as many shrimp up here, but um, they do eat a lot of shrimp. So it's nice to have a pattern that can kind of work double duty. So that'll be the first one I'll tie. I'll get into the uh, the other pattern later. So um, why don't you take suggestions for your little crab friend for names for him? So what, yeah, if uh, y'all want to post on here, maybe some names for the crab. I could, I'll look into them. Maybe maybe one of them will finalize or you know become the name for the final pattern. But give y'all one last look at it before we get going here from every angle so a couple quick things about them um the way i tie this fly i do tie it to be fished fairly shallow but um i typically use more weight fishing shallow than most people would recommend most people would say use a small lead eye or maybe like a medium brass eye but um i like to use medium lead the i need it to get down fast i need it to be on the bottom and i need it to jig that's the big thing with this. I need the fly to hop when I'm fishing it. I want it to hop up and down very quickly. That's a that's one thing that I found our redfish here in Virginia, North Carolina area. That's one thing they really, really like is a fly that hops. So that's why a lot of people will probably say I'm using too much weight, but um, we'll, we'll go with it. It's been very successful for me in the past. So... First things first, we'll go ahead and get the hook started in the vise. The hook that I use for this fly is an A-Rex SA280 Minnow number one. The uh, I've used a variety of hooks. I used to use the uh, Gamagatsu SC15 uh, one aught, and it's a great hook. I just not super big on the sharp stinger bend that the. Uh, SC15 had where it pointed the hook got, or it pointed the uh, point so sharply down I felt like I was missing some fish because of it whereas the minnow is closer to an inline bend but not uh not completely go ahead and get that guy fixed in the vise I'm not going to be putting this in the vise inline and I'll explain why as I go so right, is that zoomed in enough for you yeah that's good go ahead and start your thread just cover the hook shank. Now, like I said, I like to use the medium lead eyes. Just plain Jane 
unpainted lead eyes, medium. The cool thing about these redfish flies, especially the crab flies, like if you're familiar with the redfish quan or the gangster crab or some of those guys, they get color, I mean, they get tied in every color combination imaginable, chartreuse in purple, chartreuse in pink, but um, I've had the most luck on the natural and then the super dark ones, like the black and purple one. Most of the fish that I catch here in Virginia are in pretty clear water. Um, I would say at least two to three foot of visibility. In the dirty water, I would suggest, you know, either going super dark like the black and purple or going, uh, going bright like fluorescent chartreuse or something like that. But uh, one thing I do recommend is always have a little bit of gold in the fly and I'll touch on that a little bit more here in a second. So I'm putting these eyes all the way up, butted against the hook eye, just because I want to have them as far back as possible to make that fly jig a little bit harder. Going to run our thread back to the, about maybe about a third of the way down the bend. Okay, before you continue, I'm going to yep. say two things, because then I'm leaving you two crazy yeah. to handle tonight's Facebook Live. If anything, it seems off tonight, Braden and Grant will be on their own. You, um, we can handle it. Remember, share the Facebook the Live. If you share it, I'd love for you to put it in the comment section because if you have your pages private, I cannot see when underneath shares that you've shared it. All you have to do, write the word shared, we're good. Um, remember, we really need you to click the love button. The more love red hearts that we get on this Facebook Live, the more people are able to view it and see you know, how Grant ties the fly as well as see you know, how the Norvice works. Every 50 shares, I will pick one winner for a net gator and stripping guards. And before these two crazies end tonight, Tim will be joining in live to go over the, March Madness yeah, the winners. drawing the new March Madness winner. By the way, thank you for everybody that voted for me. I advanced to the next round. Awesome. I really appreciate it. You know your chair can go up if you need I'm to. Good. Your, I'm good. I'm comfortable. Okay. Down. Rocking the March Madness shirt, too, by the way. Yep. Who, you, Killing you know, it. Let us know if anybody in March Madness received your shirts. But what was I saying? Oh, Tim. They'll be on for the winners from this week and to draw this coming week's uh, category. category. Okay. I will be monitoring you two down. The there we go. We uh, just standard orange Estaz. It's, uh, you can use the petite stuff if you tie it a little bit smaller, like if you tie this in a uh, two or a four, you can use the petite or even cactus chenille. It doesn't really matter. This is just one thing I try to incorporate in all the crab flies I tie is something orange, um, suggestive of eggs, just add a little bit more realism to them. I've had, uh, I've had people tell me in the past that fish key in on orange, especially on crabs, just because... They know the crab has eggs in it. I don't know if it's something they just know, but they seem to like it. So tie that in, like I said, about a third down the bend, and we'll go ahead, and I like to lay the vise on its side for this, just so I can see what I'm doing clearly. Three or four wraps of this, just enough to kind of give it a hot spot. Get our thread back to where we need it, and capture it. Two or three wraps behind. Snip that off. All right. Now, just make it tie-in point nice and pretty. I say nice and pretty. If there was ever a fish that didn't care if the fly was nice and pretty, it's probably a redfish. They don't have the world's best eyesight, but um, they, they definitely pick up on some stuff and... You don't need to make these things look perfect. They just need to be suggestive. Definitely get the right profile, the right size, and all that stuff. So the next material is uh, one of my favorite materials in the world. I I've used this stuff forever for flies from trout flies to bass flies, snakehead flies, redfish flies now. Um, I've even used it in, you know, as like a core wrap for musky flies. It's, it's just a material you can get anywhere. It's a Palmer chenille. This is the medium size in root beer. Um, I love the root beer for uh, redfish flies. It's kind of got, it's a dark tan color, but as you can see in the light, it's almost got a gold hue to it, which is just a way to add that, that little bit of subtle gold flash. 
Um, if you go down to Louisiana and ask any of those old guys what their what the number one redfish lure of all time is, they're gonna tell you probably a Johnson Gold Minnow, just a just a gold spoon, just a straight up as plain as it can be, just a gold spoon. And they throw them in the in the marsh, and they still catch fish to this day. So I always like to add a little bit of gold. It's been known forever. Reds love gold. A lot of the over like a lot of the uh, baits you buy off the shelf for redfish have a lot of gold in them. So I'll keep keep adding that. Do three or four wraps, just enough to uh, to cover that. Basically, give yourself a nice veil around that orange, uh, the orange estaz. Got it nice and covered. But you don't want to do it so thick that you can't still see the orange. You want it to kind of bleed through because all of this is going to get covered as well. So the big thing is make sure all your fibers are pointing forward. I like to kind of just preen them back with my hands and then capture them with the thread. As you can see, all these tie-in points are almost, I mean, they're all tight up against each other because we want to have this whole flat section of the shank for our crab body. Whereas all of this is still, I mean, we've only used about probably less than a 16th of an inch of the, uh, of the hook shank. So next is a material that probably, in my opinion, it flies pretty under the radar. You don't see very many people using this stuff. I don't know why. Um, I like it. I've, I've used it a lot. It's, it's a really, really cool material to add. Just, it's a, just, I mean, I've never seen anything like it up until a few years ago and I've used it a ton since then. It's the uh, Montana Fly Company rubber hackle. This is the yellow brown color just because I would, I wouldn't take too much stock in what they call the colors because there really isn't much yellow in it. It's, it's more of a brownish tan, I guess, but, um, I would try and get in a fly shop and see this stuff before you buy it because the colors don't exactly look like what they say they're supposed to look like. But um, it's a really cool material. It's basically just a brush made out of nothing but rubber legs. The other, um, a, a substitute for this material would be uh, if you wanted to put it into a dubbing loop, a uh, Senyo Shaggy Dub. It's basically just a bag full of these little rubber legs. You can take some of it, put it in a dubbing loop with tons of wax, and do two or three wraps of it and get the same effect. These just make it a little bit easier. So, I'm going to go to the side that I used last. Get down to the core. Catch, catch that wire. Just tie it down good and tight. You're going to be putting some tension on this. go now these can be a little tricky to work with but it's not the end of the world you you don't need the whole brush or anything you just we need a good amount of legs on the fly just to be these are kind of suggestive of claws when the fly is done and you'll see as we wrap it i usually get about three or four wraps and treat it like a hackle try and preen the fibers back or treat preen the legs back as you wrap and we're doing the same thing we veiled the uh orange estaz and root beer palmer chenille now we're veiling the palmer chenille and this rubber hackle a great tool to have for this it's right here is a needle you kind of get in here and if you see any like sometimes these legs will get bound up in bunches one or two legs bound up isn't a big deal but if you see you know a quarter inch of the brush is all bound up you definitely need to pick that out um so you got a question from yeah. ashton goodyear about what bobbin that is um james already replied but uh could you go ahead and talk about it a little bit yeah this is the uh the norvice automatic bobbin this is the bobbin that kind of completes the norvice system um Took me a little while to get used to it when I started tying on the Norvice, but uh, it's definitely something once you get used to it, you can't put it down. It, uh, In my experience, it saves you a lot of thread because you don't end up tearing through thread as bad. Basically, as you tie, you're building tension 
on the spring inside and you watch the vise, I mean, not the vise, the bobbin basically just sucks the thread back up for you. It's uh, it's great when you're wrapping materials, you can pull the uh, pull the bobbin off to the side of the Norvice onto the thread post, hold your, hold your thread in place, keep it out of the way. And when you're done, you can just suck it right back to the fly. It's, in my opinion, if you tie on the Norvice, it's, it's a definitely a must have. But um, after we've done about four, maybe five turns, whatever looks like it's gonna veil that, that um, root beer chenille properly, go ahead and capture that brush. And you'll see when you first capture that brush, you're gonna have legs going everywhere. I mean, they're just same thing, like it's a hackle or anything, kind of work the fibers back. Um, I had a guy, one of the guys that taught me a lot about fly tying when I first got started, called it the three finger rule. Basically you take your fingers like, like a triangle. When you slide them over the fly, it grabs just about all the material you could, you could ever need. So we'll go ahead and start forcing these back and covering the tie in with some thread wraps. And this is the only really tedious part of this fly. You just really want to make sure you get everything forced back in the right direction. One tricky thing with this uh, rubber hackle is if you really crank down on it, you're going to force the rubber to kind of go in every direction. You're, I'm, I'm using tight wraps, but they're more controlled wraps than they are like hard pressure. They're just there to keep the material in place. This is tied on a wire brush. It's, it's not going anywhere. Once you get it tied down, that the memory is going to get into that brush, and that brush isn't going to let it let it unravel. It's the other thing. This this fly, the way I tie it, it's it's tied pretty much bomb proof. So, got that in. If you look, you're always going to have some unruly legs. I go ahead and get in there and just get the unruly ones out. You're you, the way that brush is. Like I said, you don't need all of them. You you're going to have enough. So just get in there, get the crazy ones out. Any ones that are short, like you have here, just go ahead and cut them off. It's not going to hurt anything. It's just all about keeping, see, here's a crazy one here. It's just all about keeping everything going in the same direction. You don't want them to be too crazy because it'll change the way the fly swims. All right. Next step is legs. These are the extension legs that go out in the front. They're suggestive of claws, or like I said, this, this fly can almost do double duty as a, uh, as a shrimp. So these can almost be suggestive of antennas as well. I like the, for this color that I'm tying, the natural color, these are uh, hairline enhancer legs. They're light blue pumpkin. And what they are is they're, uh, they're like a uh, green pumpkin or, or a light pumpkin brown that's tipped in blue. Very, very good uh, crabby leg imitation. So what I like to do, I like to use, leave the blue tips on just because they, uh, most of your blue crabs and even your small fiddler crabs, the very tips of their claws are blue. So I'm going to take these guys. They come on these little tabs, just like jig skirt material. It's all the same stuff. And we will peel a couple legs off. And I don't typically use the whole leg. And I'll show you why. See how they're they're striped? You go from blue to tan. <coughs> Excuse me. Go from blue to tan to blue. So once you peel these guys off, two legs off the tab is enough for the whole fly. And one side they'll still be attached together. That's fine. But that'll be a blue tip. And then you measure them out. I like them to extend maybe about a hook shank length past the uh, past the end of the rubber legs or past the end of that rubber hackle. We'll go ahead and just cut that tab in half and tie these in on the side. Get our thread back to where we want it. And still keeping this... Uh, Still keeping the um, tie-in point right at the top of the bend of the hook. So got those tied in on the on my near side, 
And then the other ones, as you can see, when you cut them in half, all you gotta do now is measure them out and you're gonna be able to find a way to make the other side have a blue tip as well. So, go ahead and get this where I want it. And that looks about right. Okay, get in there and just make sure you're not capturing any of that rubber hackle. Let's see, get in there and cut the butts of the legs off. And just kind of even up your tie-in point, work your thread tight up against the previous tie-in point. And what I do with these when I'm done tying them in, I actually the gap in the jaw itself, I just kind of tuck them in there and it keeps them out the way. I don't have to worry about them anymore. If you have a material clip, it'll work. But uh, more often than not with this fly, I don't leave them long enough to be captured in this material clip. So a lot of times I'll just stick them down in here. It keeps them out the way. One more step before we get to the body material is eyes. Now, I have some eyes made up, but I figured I'd go ahead and show you how I make eyes really quick. This is, uh, depending, I make eyes out of two, two sizes of mono. If I want them to be larger eyes and maybe more pronounced, like I'll do them on this fly on a little bit heavier mono. Uh, this is, well, let's see. Where's my, other, where's my other mono? Yeah, I'll go ahead and use the heavy stuff or the little bit lighter stuff. This is, uh, I like to use 50 for most of it, but on some flies, I use the eyes to actually be a structural component of the fly. If the eyes are going to be there for structure, I use 80 pound mono because it's a little stiffer. But if I just want them to be there for eyes and they serve no structural part of the fly at all, I just use the 50. Any questions? Uh, no, so far. Gotcha. So take about a inch and a half or two, like inch and a half pieces of... 50 pound mono, cut them off of there. And I kind of like to leave a little bit of bend in them and you'll see why in a sec. All you need is a lighter and a Sharpie. You're gonna take your mono, hit it with the lighter and watch as it begins to form a ball on the end. Like so if it kind of becomes a little deformed, that's fine. Just get it, there you go. After you burn it a couple times, it'll get a nice, pretty much perfectly round ball on the end. Cool it off a little bit. I like to kind of just sit it hanging off my vise. It takes it a second to uh, second to cool down and do the other eye. Normally when I make eyes, I make a bunch of them at a time. And there we go. Another perfectly round little shrimp or crab eye. Next step is you can dip them in nail polish. That, that works great. Or if you're kind of making them on the fly, a Sharpie will color them just fine. Get in there, color the eye, whatever color you want. I usually just use black. But um, like I said, a lot of these redfish flies come in tons and tons of colors. So if you want to add a little bit of accent to the fly you know fluorescent orange or bright green or i've seen pink and purple eyes just something cool to do so got that eye nice and colored and only one thing to do after that we'll go ahead and do this one and then we i seal them up in uv resin no matter what you always want to seal them in uv resin um they make the uv resin colored material now so you can buy uh solares makes it i think loon makes it the um it's just regular uv resin like you'd use fly time but it comes in colors so you can get them in black orange green i mean pretty much every color you can think of after you do this burning of the mono dip it in uh, a little bit of that resin hit it with the light and you'll be done in one step versus two but um i just find i always have sharpies laying around 
and it's cheaper than buying a uh, $15 bottle of resin every time I want a new color. So, got that col colored up. Only thing left to do, this is just uh, Solar Res Bone Dry. This is my preferred head cement. Uh, just a super, super thin, watery head cement. Get this guy out. And just give that eye a generous little coating. And then hit it with your UV light. Keep the UV light away from your eyes. Braden. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Get that guy good and cured. And you have a glossy, nice little shrimp eye. Even got a little, it almost looks like a pupil right in the center, as you can see. So, just something to do. I, I typically, when I make these, I have a whole box full of them. I mean, I'll, I'll make 25, 30 of them at a time. That way I don't have to worry about it. But um, I just figured I'd incorporate that into the live. Just a quick little how-to to make these. They're, they're quick and easy and save you a lot of money if you buy those... Uh, pre-made shrimp eyes you're paying ten dollars sometimes for 20 of them and they look identical to this so just a tip get that guy good and cured good to go all right so last thing we did tying wise another thing you'll do with this fly as you tie you'll see some of these legs will get wonky if you come in here and the legs are going all over the place, like I was doing earlier, just snip the crazy ones out. It'll make the final product look a lot better. So, for eyes, I like to lay them. I'll show you on your side first, and then I'll tie them in on my side, and then this one. But uh, I like to lay them so that they come right to the end of that rubber hackle. Pretty much dead even with the end of the hackle, or where that where all those little rubber legs end. Just tie them in on the sides. And the reason I said I like that little bit of curve is it helps these eyes stand out. Um, let me know when you get to a stepping point. All right, when I tie this next eye in, I'll be at one. So when you're done, you'll see that eye kind of pokes away from the fly. It's perfect. It's what I want it to look like. Now we'll get this one tied in, even them up nice. nice and even and then one thing I suggest after tying in mono eyes like this is to hit all your like your tie-in point hit it with a little bit of a uh, resin to hold everything in place because that mono is slippery and you don't want it to slide around as you're tying the fly you know as you're putting pressure on it or anything so just a little bit more of that, a little bit more of the uh, bone dry and just, just a light coat. You don't have to coat everything, just a couple dabs on the thread just to kind of seal everything up. And, uh, so. All right, so guys, remember to uh, hit the heart button. That'll just help uh, get this video out to more people to see it. Um, but also I wanted to remind y'all to uh, share because share the live video for every 50 shares Norvice will be giving away um, uh, Net gators and stripping guards So hundred shares uh, they'll be giving away too, but for every 50 shares they'll be giving away net gators and stripping guards See my brush fell somewhere my brush might not, Where'd it go? Let's see Looking for my brush, I sat it over here. It's like the exact same color as the, <laughs> as the countertop. See if you see it anywhere. It's that striped brush that I make. I'm gonna hang it. I saw my box. Yeah, I do need to brush, brush this actually. <laughs> Let's see. Looking for my, my like crustacean brush that I make, like the EP brush. Um, I had it sitting right here. Seeing, oh, here it is. It fell down. We got it. Okay, cool. So, um, 
Oh, wait, we got one more step. Sorry. <laughs> the uh, next step is the weed guard. This is same idea. Just um, this is 50 pound mono. No problem. But the this is one of the reasons why I use this uh, this minnow hook. One of the features of this um, this A-Rex minnow hook is it has a very large hook eye. The, the hook eye is huge compared to most flies or most hooks. It helps a lot with the attachment of this weed guard and how I do it. I will show you. Take about a, I don't know, three inch piece of mono. Just, you don't, doesn't matter how long it is. Just, it just needs to be long enough. You don't want to have to cut it later. Or, I mean, you can't make it any longer later. We're going to go ahead and run that down the shank of the hook, just attaching it this way. When I first attached this weed guard this way, I didn't really like it, and I'll be honest, I still don't really like it, but um, it seems to really, really, really keep the fly weedless because it keeps the weed guard directly in line with the hook point. We'll go ahead and run this thread all the way up tight up against the lead eyes. And what we're gonna do, we're actually gonna just go ahead and pass the mono through the hook eye. And it'll just kind of hang there and be out of the way. Now, run our thread back up to our previous tie-in point. And we're pretty much on to the last material that we're going to tie in. This is the part where I kind of make this fly my own, I guess. This is a brush that I make. It is a EP fiber blended brush. As you can see, it's tan and blue with gold and root beer flash in it. It's just a, uh, just a color that I've started catching a lot of fish on and I've always liked it. You can buy commercially made brushes just like this. Uh, the EP Crustacean brush, um, they make the Lively Legs brush. There, there's a ton of brushes like this that work. This is just a way to tie this fly quicker. You can also tie this fly with um, Merkin style where you're taking clumps of um, EP fiber and tying them in in figure eights and then trimming them at the end. That was the original version of this fly. That was how I had originally tied all that stuff in, but it took too long. I started making brushes and realized there's no difference. It you know it, it doesn't change the doesn't change the action of the fly. Doesn't change any of that anything important. It just makes it a little quicker to tie. So I decided to go with the brush. If you happen to have EP fiber lying around, that'll work just fine. But if you got a shop that has the crustacean brushes and you want to speed up your tie, it's a good way to do it. So all it is is just wire with a bunch of material in it. I'm going to clear the core out so I got a good thing, good little smooth tie in there. Like so get it nice and clean. And then we're going to capture it right up against all of our previous tie ins. Make sure to get good tight wraps down that uh, wire core so it can't go anywhere. And then go ahead and get your thread down and get it out of the way. Now, you're going to treat this just like any all the other materials we had. We preen all the fibers back towards the front of the fly, technically, and we're going to start wrapping. This fly, if I didn't tie all the stuff on the bend, you could keep this fly in, in line and use the rotary function. But um, I find it a little easier just to do this by hand. These brushes are so thick, you don't really get a ton of, a ton of uh, wraps with it, maybe about five on the whole shank. So there's one. And it's easiest just to keep preening and brushing your fibers back as you go. Once I get to the top of the hook shank, I like to hit all the sides with a quick little brush to keep everything pointed the right way. That's two wraps. Up there. 
um, Mike Holschauser. I don't know if I said your last name right. Sorry, um, <laughs> sorry if we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, asked, what size wire do you use for your brushes? Um, 32 gauge. Um, you can get wire a lot cheaper online. If you just search 32 gauge stainless wire on Amazon, eBay, whatever, um, the wire I got, I think is actually used for, um, it's like for making vape coils. Oh. The wire I use, uh, it's called, actually, if you look in my material box, you'll see it. It's a spool about this big. It should be all the way up against where the hinges are. It says Master of Clouds on it. Oh, nice. But, um, you see it? Yeah. yeah. I'll show you the wire I use right here. <laughs> um, 32 gauge stainless, and it is Master of Clouds brand. I don't know. It's just, it's 250 foot of stainless wire, and it's like six bucks. Whereas a little, like, 50 foot spool of dubbing brush wire, which is the exact same thing, costs like six bucks. So, another, another way to save a little money. All right, so that was like our fourth wrap. I don't know. I'm just kind of wrapping this all the way down up to the eyes. Constantly brushing just to give it a little, it'll just make our trimming process easier at the end. And what I like to do, I just contacted the eyes. I like to wedge one more wrap in there once I reach the eyes like so, get it back up to the top, bring our thread back. Before I capture this brush with our thread, I'm gonna go ahead and give it a, another taming of the material here. Like so. Then get down in there real close to the eyes. Get about three wraps on the brush. Then pull any fibers you got going forward back and get two or three wraps right behind the brush to really wedge it in there. And that thing is not going anywhere. Like I said, the brushes make them, make these flies a lot more durable as well because yeah, it's in a brush and it, like it's in a wire core and it's got a um got some memory to it. But as you're wrapping it tighter and tighter and tighter as you go, you're forcing your you're basically forcing memory into the brush. So even if something happens and your thread breaks, chances are that brush isn't going to unravel on you. It's going to be forced around. Um I think I saw a question. Somebody asked what thread I was using. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um this is just regular 210 denier Flymaster. It's uh, typically all of my saltwater patterns I use 210 because especially when I'm cranking on brushes like this, you want some you want some strong thread. You don't want to uh, you don't want like 140 to to nick that brush because it'll it will cut it like dental floss. So got all that straightened out. Now there's two ways to do this. You could whip finish your thread off now and trim the fly out and then attach, like get the weed guard in place later. I don't usually do that. I go ahead and attach the weed guard. Gotcha. But yeah, I use the, uh, I go ahead and use the, do the weed guard now. So what I do, my thread right now is behind the eye. This is just the way I've found to keep this weed guard nice and in line. I go from behind the eye to in front of the weed guard, then back behind the eye again. And you see it's it's got the got the weed guard up nice and straight now, but I do that about six or seven times. It builds up a pretty strong thread pull on the on the weed guard. You see how it's trying to pull it down? That's fine. Go ahead and force that weed guard back against the thread. And then with this big eye of this A-Rex minnow hook, I jump my thread in front of the lead eyes, but now behind the weed guard. And all I'm doing is putting positive and negative pressure on that 
weed guard. And it's just cinching it in place and it's basically forcing it to stand up perfectly straight. Like so. And I keep kind of tweaking it as I go. Once you've got it sitting up nice, perfectly straight, you'll notice it's perfectly in line because the, the uh, mono is coming through the eye of the hook, so it's going to be right in line with the hook point. I like to kind of give it a little press down to see where it's going to contact the hook and then give it just a little bit extra to work with. And you'd be amazed what that little, little short piece of mono right there will do for a day of fishing. It will save you so much hassle. And now, when we're all done with that, the fly is essentially finished. You can go ahead and whip finish. I like to whip finish behind the weed guard. Like so. It's really, really useful to be able to do it with your hands here because uh, you're gonna have a hard time whip finishing and like forcing the material through that brush. Once you got it good and snug, snip that off close. And I'm gonna go ahead and put a little dab of head cement kind of all over the exposed thread. Just like so. They're nice and just just sealing everything up, and it's gonna make the uh, it's gonna make the weed guard stand up better as well. Boom. And once you get, I notice I put I put resin on both sides of the fly, so it really helps to spin here and get the resin cured evenly. Terry Landry and uh, Larry Braswell both said that you explained very well, and uh, Larry said, awesome tie. Thank you. Got another cool one coming up here in a minute. Uh, the next crab fly tie is going to be one of my personal favorites. I used to fish it a lot, then went a couple years without being able to find the material. I'll be honest, I didn't look that hard. I didn't order it online, <laughs> where I certainly could have, but uh, I don't know. I just kind of went around and tied a bunch of different stuff, but... Going back to one of my favorite crab flies here in a minute, too. So, now, how are we going to fish that? Just a big ball of junk. So, we're going to do, we're going to get in here. This is another reason why, at the beginning of the fly, I tucked these legs into the jaw. It's just a silly little hack that I kind of noticed while tying this fly. It will keep you from snipping those legs off. So take a good pair of razor scissors. Um, one of my favorite pairs of scissors you can buy for cutting synthetics are your plain old crafting Fisker scissors. They last, I think they last a significant amount of time longer than regular scissors. And they're, uh, they're cheap. They're like eight bucks at Walmart. So we're going to go ahead and get this squared up. Kind of make sure your material is all going in the direction you want. Then we're going to cut it off. Nice and flat. The nice thing about this, you kind of have a built-in trimming guide with these eyes. I like to sit my scissors right on the eyes, make sure I'm not going to cut any legs, snip it off. And make sure it's nice and flat on the bottom. There's a couple ways you can modify this fly with trimming as well. Um, if anyone's familiar with the Defiant Crab pattern, it's a pattern that's tied with a really thick head of uh, EP fiber and a really thin body, like a really thin tail area. It makes the crab stand up vertical like that. You can easily do that if you plan to fish this crab, just kind of plopping it in the, in the water and letting them come to it. That's a great way to do it because these uh, silicone legs are going to float. But um, this fly, I typically swim it, so I'm going to try and trim it as flat as possible. Now, the weed guard can kind of get in your way, but not too much. Just gonna go in here and kind of force my scissors through the material and start cutting. Just kind of get in there and pull all of it out as you go. Hmm. 
the cool thing about tying these with these brushes is every fly is going to come out a little different. Some of them are going to come out really, really blue in some spots. Some of them are going to come out really pretty and mottled. Um, other ones may, may only have a tiny bit of blue in certain areas, but it, they all look similar enough, but they, uh, I just like the variation in them. It kind of comes out a little more natural. So you're going to keep kind of brushing the fiber out now, now that you've kind of flattened the fly into a, essentially just a disc of material, you're going to just kind of force all the flies or all the material out like so this is a great fly to tie in bulk you kind of do it there's so many stages you can do the way i typically tie them in bulk is tie the whole head section with the eyes legs chenille the estaz all that stuff and then i tie all the brush parts at the same time and then obviously do all the trimming at the same time so good rule of thumb for a size one crab you want it to be about the size of anywhere between a nickel and a quarter. A quarter gets pretty big. It's uh, I like to look about, about the size of a nickel for the body. And we are going to work towards that here. Just be careful when you're trimming. You do not want to cut any... You don't want to cut your, uh, your two rubber legs in the front here. You can afford to snip a few of that, few of those rubber legs from that wiggle hackle, but uh, definitely don't want to cut your two uh, antenna legs up front. And you can see there's still some areas where the material is kind of tall on top, and that's fine. Just as long as you've got plenty of hook gap. And uh, I actually kind of like the way it looks when you get a little bit of a dome of material in the center. It looks a little bit more crabby with that, you know, how they kind of have a thicker shell in the center. And just kind of shape it by hand. After I do the rough shaping, I usually pull it out of the vise. start kind of looking at it from all angles to make sure I like where it's going so these can take a few minutes to trim but it's uh it's worth it as long as you get them nice and flat and disc shaped they're gonna swim better and the more symmetrical you make them the better they're gonna swim they don't have to be mirror images of each of itself, you know, on each side of the hook shank, but just try and keep it even. The same amount of material, roughly, on each side. Um, Andrew Bujold, I don't know if you if I said your we last are name. We're sorry right if we again. mess if we don't say um, your names correctly. I know it's gonna happen again later on in this live. Um, he said, "What would you call this fly?" I don't remember you having a name. It does not have a name. I was actually asking for suggestions. Uh, earlier in the live so if anybody's got suggestions for names i'd like to hear them might help me uh might sway me into naming this guy i've got a few names in mind but uh haven't really settled on one yet I like funny names, so if anybody comes up with a funny name, post it. So you get in here close. Need a little bit. I like to use a real fine point scissor when I get in here around the hook eye, just because I, I mean the uh, the bend, just because I can really control how much material I'm removing. Andrew said you can call it the what would you call it five thousand? <laughs> That's a mouthful. <laughs> We got the Krabby Patty. That's already been taken. Mr. Clicks, Fisker Crab, Krabby McCrab. <laughs> Krabby McCrab face. <laughs> uh. Mr. Krabs. Bunch of good names. I think pretty much all the SpongeBob related ones, if I remember, they've all been taken. Because I was a SpongeBob fan when I was a kid. Yeah. And, uh, 
Yeah, when I looked, there was a... The, the Braden's Room Fly. <laughs> yeah. The, the Crackpot Crab, Crabzilla. All right. <laughs> Let's see here. Just doing a little final trimming, and we're pretty much done. This is just me being picky. You don't need to get this, this fine-tuned with it. But as you can see, like I said, some of these brushes, they come out all modeled and different. This one is almost entirely, you can't really see it that well in the camera, but it's almost entirely blue on one side. I, I know it doesn't matter. I like it. I, I think they look cool when you do it with the brush. That's one thing. If you tie it Merkin style um, with clumps of EP, you can strike the fly. You can... You know, you can really control where the color is in the fly. You can even, uh, you can even blend the EP in the clumps and make it modeled yourself. But, um, you know, I, I just like the brush, like I said, solely from a ease of tying standpoint because you're pretty much going to spend just as much time trimming the fly when you do the Merkin style crab. So, I just like the, uh, like the quick like how much quicker it makes it and in my opinion it makes it a little more durable um i've noticed these flies lasting a lot longer since i use the brushes the first variation of this fly that had a brush was that ep crustacean brush and i have one that's probably caught i don't know a dozen fish and you can't even you can't even tell it's even caught one um terry landry said beautiful crab um, thank you, thank you. Kevin Pinhorn said, nice job from Cape Britain, Breton, um, Nova Scotia. I don't know if I said that right. You probably didn't. Nope. <laughs> the Crab, crab Alvis. Um, now, the one I will say, the one uh, crab name that um, has kind of been in my head and a couple people had actually said was the G-Money Crab. And I'm kind of leaning that way, but I don't love it, per se. I don't know. Okay. So we got a nice kind of symmetrical crab body. Maybe a little pointy in one spot, but uh, you get the gist. We, All right. We got the cream circle crab, the OK, the Lenny Kravitz. The Lenny Kravitz. Yeah. That's cool. I like Lenny Kravitz, too. That's funny. <laughs> That's nice. Um. All right. Say, Go so ahead. Tim wants Cliff. to join in. He and wants to join you, in now. And then you tie the, your other fly. Okay, yeah. I got one more fly to tie, but just in case some of y'all are here just to see the next fly category, we'll go ahead and let uh let Tim join in. So go ahead and Tim and request to join or however you and mom did it last time. I don't know. I, I'm just waiting to see the guest request to come up. Um, oh. <laughs> Say what? <laughs> yes, Terry. <laughs> There we go. I was just separating those legs. That was the side that had the uh, the, next the tab Kelly, on it. The next Kelly Gallup. <laughs> yes. So as you can see, nice uh, crabby slash shrimpy profile there. It is a killer when thrown in front of uh, a red, whether he's feeding, schooling, cruising, you name it. I've had them all eat it. It is a fun fly to fish. This fly also uh, can be trimmed way down in size, tied on like a size eight hook, and uh, I've actually caught carp on it. So kind of a crawfish imitation too, and it gets that small. So while we're waiting on Tim, guys, um, go ahead and you can keep asking questions and putting more funny names in, uh, for uh, Grant's fly. Um, Vianza doesn't have a name just yet. And... Um, Remember to share the live for every 50 shares. Norvice will be giving away uh, Norvice stripping guards and uh, Norvice net gator. So 100 shares, you'll be giving out two um, of each prize packages. Um, and also, clicking the heart on this live and liking the live will um, help promote the live and more people will see it. So that always helps if you would like to do that. Um, but we're just uh, waiting on... While waiting on Tim, I'll go ahead and say thank you uh, 
again to everyone who voted for my fly in March Madness this week. Uh, I'm moving on to the Elite Eight. It's kind of cool. Um, this is the actual fly right here. I didn't realize I had it with me, but uh, the Flexo Crab. Definitely a killer crab pattern. It's actually probably the number one permit fly in the world. Uh, it's I think it's technically called the Al Flexo Crab, as in like Alphonse Island where the Seychelles are. And yeah, just a really cool, flexible bodied, awesome crab imitation. And we, I've caught reds on these before in the past. Never one I tied. It was a store-bought one, but I matched the store-bought one pretty well. So now we're going to let Tim come in. All right. Oh, there I I can see uh, the ranch. Long here. time no see, Tim. Yeah, <laughs> it was. I, I I literally just walked down the stairs to the, to the room down here. How was so, the drive? Uh, it wasn't bad. It was, uh, I left. Uh, down there at quarter three and I just got here a quarter of eight so about five hours so for those of you who don't know uh, Braden and Grant and I did a um, and, and Casey did an event at the South River Fly Shop this weekend and uh, down in Virginia and then this morning we went to fish a little piece of water over in um, Lexington Virginia and I left these guys this afternoon at quarter three and then just drove five hours to get back up to northern Delaware and I literally, this is not a joke, I literally just backed the truck in and came downstairs to the room. So, um, we, have the, yeah. we have the, uh, the bracket, uh, the, new, the new bracket for this week. It's, it's already done. We're going to post it. I'm probably not going to get to it tonight. Uh, we'll probably get it up tomorrow. Um, great, great battles this week. There was one, Corey Kendrick and Jock Scott, and we were watching it at the time that the clock struck 506 we were actually driving home from the event and we, we pulled, pulled the car over we <laughs> pulled over on the side of the road and uh as soon as the clock struck 506 which was 24 hours we took the screen grab and um jock scott won by literally one vote in 24 hours it was like six it's like point zero zero one percent. Yeah, it was it was six whatever it was like I don't know five or six forty two to six forty. That's that's like, pretty pretty insane with that number of votes. That's crazy. What one of one of Jock's votes? It was not the um, it was not the thumbs up or the heart. It was the little surprise emoji. So that one didn't count. So it was like six forty one to six forty after exactly twenty four hours. Absolutely insane, and. Um, I mean, that's good. It, it's, we, you know, we're getting a lot of good response from it. So, uh, you know, hopefully everybody's having fun. Um, we, we are, we, we have a running total of the, you know, highest amount of likes. And then if, if the same person gets the highest amount of likes in a, in a, um, in the next bracket, we're going to drop down to the next highest amount of likes and we're going to get all the prizes and everything figured out. So, um, good stuff. Glad you guys are with us. I've got the, I don't know if you can see it. There they are. Where's my camera? There you go. The bucket um, of the bucket of categories. <laughs> the bucket of categories. I'm gonna shake them up. I'm not looking. I don't want to nip anymore because Braden's out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Braden's, yeah gone. Braden's out. So no dry flies. All right. So here I'm gonna pick one. Yeah, now that he's out, we'll get dry flies. All right. Here we go. Oh, somebody's gonna be mad. Ha! <laughs> Are you kidding me? Nope, that's what came Jeez. out, dude. Oh, so of course, when I go... Is gone, we, we, uh, we actually got into love the it. legacy category, which is cool. Um, and it is Blaine Chocolate. So Blaine just yeah. uh, just published a book, the Game Changer book. It's out. There's um, a lot of different variations of, of patterns oh, in there. Of and then he has the, the new series, the... I don't know the critter changers or whatever whatever he calls them. So yeah, this is um, this is going to be a um, this is going to be a good one. So yeah, the category is Blaine chocolate has to be a Blaine chocolate pattern. Now there will only be we're in the we're in the great eight. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, we're in yeah. the great eight. So there will only be four brackets 
this this week. So we are going to post all four brackets on Friday evening. So it'll be Friday in and around five o'clock. We schedule okay. the posts. Sometimes Facebook puts them up at five. Sometimes they don't go up till five ten or whatever. But they will. All four will go up in and around five o'clock, and then five o'clock on Saturday, the voting will close, and we will have the final four. Has to be a Blaine chocolate pattern. Has to be in to Casey by five o'clock on Thursday Eastern Standard Time. Okay. So I'm going to hop off of here. Everybody has their category. And hold on, Tyler said one more thing. Uh, I put together a bunch of shank jaws tonight. So sometime tomorrow night, they're going to go back up on the website. So keep refreshing the website and stay tuned because tomorrow night we're going to have another batch of shank jaws up there. So if you didn't get them the first time, here's your chance. There you go. So shank jaws will be up on the website sometime tomorrow night. I've been away for a few days doing this event, so I'm I'm probably behind on some administrative stuff that I got to get caught up on. But um, they'll be up hopefully sometime tomorrow. So keep checking the website, and then if you missed it the first time, you'll be able to order. So Blaine Chocolate. Picture to Casey by 5 o'clock on Thursday, Eastern Standard Time. All four brackets will be posted Friday night in and around 5 o'clock. The voting will run for 24 hours, and we will have our final four by Saturday at 5. And the Shank Jaws will be back up on the website tomorrow. So that's all I got, guys. I got to go eat something because I've been driving for five hours. Um, good luck, and I'm going to hop off, and Grant can tie the next pattern. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Tim. See you, Tim. Oh no. Drop it? Yeah. Gotcha. All right. And we're back. Okay. I'm happy because we got plain chocolate patterns and I do a lot of plain chocolate patterns. It's going to be fun. Okay. Next crab fly. Uh, this is one of my favorite crab flies. This probably is my favorite. Um, in my opinion, it's the best looking crab fly on the market. Um, it's just a just a killer imitation. It it swims great. It almost always. I mean, it never has any keeling problems. It's just. I mean, it just looks perfect. It's got a lot of nice modeling to the body. The only thing about it, the underside isn't necessarily pretty. You got all that stuff exposed. There's a couple other ways to tie this fly, and I'll get into it as we get in there, but it's called the McFly Crab. I mean, it doesn't get much more crabby than that, and it's perfect. Just a little nickel-sized flats crab. Uh, for the longest time, this was the going rate for the permit anywhere you wanted to go, but um, redfish love them too. You throw this in front of a uh, feeding redfish or even just cruising redfish. If they see it, they're going to eat it. So really cool little pattern. We're going to tie this guy. That's actually surprisingly easy. So same hook in the vise. It is the A-Rex Minnow number one, the SA-280. Go ahead and get that guy in there. Terry Landry said, so Grant, do you know Blaine's patterns? <laughs> I, I might know a few. And uh, your mom says that your dad has a name for your crab, the Spot Tail Slammer. That could work. The Spot Tail Slammer. The funny looking croaker crusher. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. All right. Um, go ahead and get your thread started on the hook. Um, I'll tell the story about the funny looking croakers. Um, a particular spot that we were fishing probably about, uh, it was probably like six years ago. Um, longer than that, honestly, it was probably seven or eight years ago. There was a particularly hot little area just that was absolutely full of redfish on an outgoing tide. I mean, you could go out there. We were catching pretty much all of them on spinning rods, but you could go out there with white gulp on a jig head and catch as many redfish as you wanted. There wasn't enough white gulp in the world. You could just sit there and just go through it. I mean, burn through buckets of it every every time you went. So I went one day, and I showed up at the boat ramp. I was sliding my kayak in the water, and this old man was coming out. 
and pulling his boat up. And then I was just making boat ramp chat, asked him, uh, oh, did you do any good out there? Oh, yeah, man, slayed him. And I was like, oh, really? Knowing what he was referring to for the most part. I was like, oh, what'd you get? He said, oh, man, we got a whole bunch of these funny-looking crocus. <laughs> I said, I, I mean, I just almost froze. I said, you got what? Whole cooler full, man. Funny-looking crocus. They all got spots on them. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, oh, you mind if I see them? Funny-looking crocus, right? He said, yeah. Got a, uh, got a, uh, Good view of about a 65 quart igloo overflowing with illegal redfish. Oh, all of the I, there might have been five redfish that were slot size, the rest were all little runts because croakers in Virginia don't really have a minimum size, I don't think. Um, oh, but yeah, good. he probably had about a felony's worth of <laughs> illegal redfish. And I told him, and he it was he was judging by his voice, he was extremely uh extremely surprised to find out that we had redfish in Virginia because most of them were not red. They were so small. They were still kind of chrome and most of them still had the spot on their tail. Some of them didn't even have a spot, but they were all, these were 100% redfish. But uh, for the longest time, the running joke at the Bass Pro Shops where I worked for a long time was uh, we're going out to catch some funny looking croakers. So that was interesting. And then he asked me what he should do with them. <laughs> I said, well, uh, they're all dead, so it <laughs> doesn't really matter what you do with them now. And he said, well, uh, should I keep them? I was like, yeah, I guess I just wouldn't get stopped on the way home. I don't really know what he did with them after that. But all right, so cover the hook shank and thread. Now we're going to get to same eyes. Like I said, I like more weight than most people do on my flats flies just because I like, especially with the crab, I like a thing to be on the bottom. Um, there we go. Um, I want the crab to be on the bottom, and I don't do a whole lot of stripping with the crabs. I just kind of do short little, like, long arm pulls like this just to scoot the guy along on the bottom, and I need it to stay down when it does that. So we're going to attach these lead eyes a little bit forward of the halfway point because we want to keep the fly balanced evenly, and the left side of the hook is going to have more weight because that's where all the – that's where all the uh, – the actual hook is. So we're going to go just a little bit to the right of the midpoint and figure eight these guys in like you would any set of lead eyes. There's actually, I'm going to do this second actually, do it the other way. There's a bunch of ways to tie this fly. I'm going to do it the way that I originally learned how to tie it because I think it's a little easier. I will show you. We'll save this for basically the second to last step save the eyes. We're going to go to the legs. The legs on this fly are all rayon, or this is that um, ultra chenille, the really, really fine stuff. And this is the ultra chenille in small. You can see it's really, really, really tightly wound chenille. And when you do it correctly, you can definitely make it look like some crab legs. So, going to take a piece, I, I usually just take pieces the width of the card, tie them in, and we'll trim them to length later. Go ahead and tie it down the whole width of the shank. Don't worry so much about keeping it you know, tightly wrapped or anything like that. Just get it tied down good and nice and even on the side of the hook. What I like to do with this first one is throw some thread wraps behind the legs to force them out like this. You'll see why when we're done. Um, you've got a question from Michael Collier. Um, have you ever flattened the eye before you tie on it or tie it on? I imagine he's talking about the, uh, the lead eye. Uh, I have and it doesn't, I don't notice it to change much at all. It would, uh, it would probably make it sit flat, but most of the time, the way this fly is tied, as you'll see when we're done, this, the carapace, the, the shell that we make, it actually covers them up nicely and actually lays all the way down around the hook. So 
it makes the uh, makes the fly basically it just fills the whole profile up. So whether you flatten the eyes or not, they're not going to be touching the bottom or anything like that. So we got those legs tied in. Like I said, I throw a few wraps of thread in there to get the legs pointing up at like a 45 degree angle. Then take another piece of chenille about the length of the card or the width of the card. And we're going to tie it in at not quite as steep of an angle. go same thing just a couple thread wraps really to force those legs back and kind of keep them in line with one another like so and I like to kind of give like Xing crossing wraps across the uh, the whole piece of chenille as I go it just makes it seem makes it a little more durable the next leg is gonna be maybe just a hair wider than the width of the card now this leg is gonna basically go right over the eye of the hook it's gonna lay right on top of the shank go right over the eye of the hook and basically your the goal is to try and keep these legs almost straight out it's not gonna impede the tying on of the fly or anything is this stuff when it gets wet it'll just flop out of the way so you can tie the fly on just kind of scoot it out the way you can actually if you wanted to you can kind of tie this if you're worried about it tie it on the near side of the hook but kind of on top at like a 45 degree angle that way you can see i got my eye nice and clear there but the nice thing about these legs when they get wet they have a whole lot of movement but they don't foul up they they will not foul up your leader or anything like that so getting there the last section of eyes or the last section of legs sorry is uh it's easier just to go ahead and take you a fairly long piece i'd say maybe four widths of the card go ahead and cut it it just makes this this part easier to do it this way Go ahead and double it up. We're going to make the claws now. So, double it up. Give it a good pull to kind of get some of that memory out of it. You can kind of stroke through it. That'll help get some of that card memory out. Now, I always start with the hard side first. We are going to put a half hitch in this chenille. The reason it helps to use a little bit longer piece is just go ahead and admit you're going to have some waste. And it makes tying of the claws and doing this half hitch a lot easier when you have some waste or some extra. So you got a nice half hitch there. I'm going to go ahead and pull it tight. You want to make sure you pull it evenly. And really get to pulling on it. You can use your teeth if you have to, just something to grip it you want to kind of compress that knot as much as you can what's going on with tim is watching is watching is watching. I, I think it just glitched or something gotcha. so yeah, we got some kind of glitch going on yeah. so once you get that tied in gonna clip that claw nice and short and there you have it nice little redfish or crab claw and now you want to use your hook to your advantage here and see where you need these claws to be the way I like them is I like to have one claw just barely sticking out, like the knuckle, just barely sticking out from the carapace. And then I like the other one to kind of be like a strong arm claw and be sticking out a little bit longer. So when I'm looking at this fly, the strong arm is the one, typically for me, I like the strong arm to be the one where the eye is. That way when I'm scooting the fly, that one is getting the most movement. So in this case, that's going to be longer side on the eye side. I will kind of measure this guy out. I want my other claw to finish right around in here. Now I got to do another half hitch. 
and it's easier with the doubled up side. Always is. Now that I said that, it won't be. And before you cinch anything down, like I said, just make sure it's where you want it. If it's not, you can kind of undo it and keep sliding it back to where you need it to be. It's nice to have a needle for this because the needle kind of gets all... The pokey stabby thing? Yeah, the pokey stabby. The needle gets, or the chenille gets so compressed that it's hard to work with sometimes. And it got away from me a little bit there. I'm going to try that to start that over again. That's why I say do not cinch this down until you're happy with it because it will get away from you. And it's a, way, it's a shame to waste all this chenille if you don't get the claws the exact length that you want them to be. So go ahead and get the half hitch. Needle helps with the half hitch too. Gives you something to grab. Okay, so that's going to be a little better there. Yep. All right. Let's see. Got any questions? Um. Well, we got yeah. one uh, from John Matthews from a little while ago. When I was waiting to say okay. this. Um, I encountered a marine fishery guy one day that quit writing tickets at $5,000 for the same redfish snafu. He said he took mercy on the guy as, uh, mercy on the guy as he could have written a $10,000 worth of, or $10,000 worth of tickets. I believe it. I'm pretty sure what was in that cooler would have, <laughs> would have been around the 10 K mark. So same situation. We got our half inch here. I'm just going to cut that claw. Like so. Now you got basically the same chenille we've already been tying in. And now you've got a double up piece with two claws on each end. Fancy, huh? All right. Going to go ahead, get this chenille, get everything kind of squared up where we want it. Make sure everything's all nice and pretty before we tie these claws in. Like I said, on the eye side, so the side that's going to be moving forward as you're pulling the fly, you want the little bit longer claw on that side just so it's swinging around. Just more of a suggestive, like a crab in a defensive position. Go. And this fly really, this is another, um, this is another really quick tie if you tie them in, you know, in stages. If you get all of this stuff squared away and ready to roll before you tie the fly, it makes it a much quicker tie. And you can really, I mean, you really can crank these out. If you sit down and cut a ton of chenille to the length you want, and stuff like that it really will speed up the process but they always take longer when you're teaching people out of time so go ahead and get that guy in there clean up all this chenille i try to make about as smooth of a base to this as i can now this part's optional um i like the look of it as you might have seen earlier the underside of my crab has a lot of orange under there if you've ever seen fiddler crabs blue crabs when they have eggs when you flip them over the eggs are always on the bottom and you can see them under their legs when they move the only way to really get any orange on this fly is to do like i'm about to do here let's see before i do the that though let me make a couple more eyes this will help if anybody's just joining us now and hadn't, didn't see it earlier. Take a couple, uh, couple pieces of mono, about, I don't know, two inches long. It actually kind of helps here to make the eyes as you make the fly, and I'll explain that in a little bit. Take your lighter with your mono. 
get it to go down into a nice little ball. This is another fly that it really helps to have some curve to the mono. There you go. Two nice little perfect balls of mono there. Oh, that black sharpie go. There she is. Take your sharpie. Get a good little coating on that ball of mono. Like so. Get the other one. When I usually make a batch of these crab eyes, I'll make make them by the dozen. If you sit down and really do it, you can make, I mean, you can make at least six or seven dozen sometimes in an hour when you really start sitting down and cranking them out. It's not that hard to do. Um, you kind of get into a groove. Brad Buzzy said, sorry for coming late to the party. Um, what sizes and type of chenille are you using? Thanks and nice crap. A type of what I'm sorry uh, chenille this is um the ultra chenille and uh, Colin callback said do you ever torch the ends of the ultra I guess ultra chenille to make it more make it look more realistic uh, yes Colin I do I do that at the very end I will show you the other or the one I've already got tied up in just a second don't point this at your eyes Braden <laughs> right <in your> eye. <laughs> it's not in my eye. It's pointing right at that picture of you on the back wall. Oh, nice. You scrub. <laughs> All right. Got that good. And now let's do a coating on this guy. This has always kind of been my preferred way to make these eyes because if you do a coating like this, it encases that pupil. And uh, it gives it the kind of natural crab eye look where it's not just a black ball. It's actually like behind a, I don't know, it looks like a pupil inside of the, inside of the lens, as you can see. Now it's kind of hollow. Just, just a cool look. But um, he asked about burning the ends of the rayon or the uh, ultra chenille. I do. Stay there. You can see this one. See how they've got they've been burned to a point. It gives a nice little dark tip like a crab leg would have, but it also makes them more durable and yeah, makes them look a little more natural as well. So next step is to tie the eyes in. These you're gonna want to center up and whatever side your claws are on, that's what side your eyes need to be on. So Go ahead and figure eight these pieces of mono in. What's going on there? Let me hit that with the torch one more time. I don't think I got it carried all the way. Hmm. Not done carrying. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. She cooked now. <laughs> got it. She cured now. Um, got it all cured up. At least I thought so. What's it doing? Nah, it's cured up. Okay. Now, figure eight these and leave them much longer than you need them to be. I will explain why when we get there. I like to leave them basically right dead center in the piece of that mono. And I figure eight these right up against each other. A little bit of curve in the mono is going to help us. It is going to give our thread something 
to pass through. It's going to guide our thread right to the center of the hook. This is just kind of a little hack that I figured out after tying a few of these. The This is going to catch our thread in a minute, and so is the gap between these two eyes. And don't worry about if they're not, not lined up right now. It doesn't matter. Now, I said I was saving the lead eyes for the last part, basically one of the last steps. Now we'll go ahead and put the lead eyes right in front of the mono eyes we just tied on. A lot of people get caught off guard by not putting lead eyes on first. Most flies you tie on lead eyes the very first thing you do. And you can do it here, but I just find them to, you have to kind of work around them. And I don't like doing it that way. I like to kind of attach all this stuff at the very end. Got a question? Uh, Patrick Farmer said, you go, boy. <laughs> Patrick Farmer. Uh, what's up, dude? <laughs> all righty. Got those guys nice and tied in. Like so. Okay. So now we got our crab eyes tied in. We got our lead eyes tied in, all of our crab legs tied in. The section I was talking about previously, I said I would hold off to the very end, is the uh, orange under the belly. This is just another suggestive thing. It gives them something to see. If you do happen to strip it and hop it up, they're going to get a little flash of this orange. Any orange dubbing will work. Um, if you've ever seen crab like eggs in person, they're not fluorescent orange. They're not super bright. Uh, this is fly fish food bruiser blend dubbing and sunburst. That is pretty much exactly the color of what crab eggs are. So going to go ahead and dub a little of this on the hook. It doesn't have to, I mean, on the thread, it doesn't have to be pretty. Just go ahead and give it a wrap. So you really got to watch you want it to be on your thread good enough to where it will not get pulled down by those eyes like so you can kind of just cover up all that tan thread from all those tie-in points i just keep making sure i mean i've, I've got it dubbed on really really heavy like i said it's not not really meant to be pretty it's just meant to be a color something to break up the color on the bottom of the fly so it's one little pinch of it now where did the rest of it eh, fell on the floor i guess oh, no, there it is we found it We're all right helps to wet your fingers a little bit with this stuff kind of tames it a little better and a couple little layers of it right there around the eyes just take it nice and slow and just kind of get a good good covering of dubbing there. And what I'll do is just kind of dub. And when you're done dubbing, you want to work your thread back to in between these two eyes. So always leave enough dubbing to make it back there. Kind of figure eight around these eyes to cover that up a little bit and now we're back to between the eyes like i said not by any means meant to be pretty it's just something to give it a little bit of a break in the color especially when this fly gets hopped off the bottom so next is a fly tying material that not a lot of people think about for a saltwater fly. This is McFly foam, the stuff you use to make egg patterns. Um, that's where the fly name comes from, the McFly crab. This stuff is, in my opinion, it is the best egg material on the market. It definitely makes the best eggs. It makes the easiest eggs, but... Um, Basically, all it is is one big, long strand of this stuff. It is super prickly. I mean, super picky. It, it grabs onto everything. 
But what we're going to do, it's in the material, it's in the package like this. You're basically going to take just one length of it, one piece that's the same length as the package from each color. I'm using tan and light olive here. So there's the tan. Now you can see it just it sticks to everything. <laughs> then the light olive. There's a piece right here. Mm, that piece is going to be a little hard to get. Just try. The big thing is to make sure you're using equal sized pieces. Like don't use a double thick piece of olive and tan. You, you want to use the same amount of each. So the width of the package there. Um, you want to answer two questions? Sure. Get on to this section. Yeah. Um, Jamie Pike said, um, or asked, what model, rod, weight, and length, and then a liter, liter weight length are you using to cast those weighted crabs? Um, my typical inshore setup for reds is a nine foot eight weight, um, fast action. My preferred line has always, or at least recently, has been any sort of like a scientific angler's uh, uh, Titan taper or tropical Titan, any of those very progressive weight forward head lines like a um, smaller known company, a Monic, they've got the Javelin line. Um, Rio has the outbound short. Any of those lines will, will do it. It's just a real short compact head so you can load the rod at close range and fire fairly long casts with minimal, uh, minimal false casting. And they also turn over big flies really, really well. The, uh, let me scoot this fly out a little bit while I'm thinking about it. Mm -hmm. I'll explain why I do that in a second. And there we go. But uh, what was the other one? Um, fly Rider asked, what size and type of thread are you using? Also a great crap pattern. Thank you. And uh, this is 210 denier, the same thread I was using on the last one, just 210 denier uh, Flymaster. Um, so what you're going to do, um, oh, I didn't touch on leader. Leader for the uh, reds, I typically just use a butt section of 30, maybe about two feet of it, and then the rest of it is either 15 or 20 pound. Just honestly, whatever I grab first. They're not super picky with a pretty delicate cast or anything. You, you just need tippet that'll handle them. And uh, a lot of fishing I do is around oyster bars, so I like to use a little bit heavier. More often than not, I use 20, but um, 15 or 20 will work fine. And usually about a seven to nine foot leader. So we're gonna kinda marry these two pieces of McFly foam together. If you ever use this material, you'll know what I mean. It just kinda sticks to everything. And then we're gonna fold it. And we're just gonna keep basically folding it on itself until we get it to basically we just do two folds you do a one half and then you fold the half and half like so and it gives you this kind of you can do it one of two ways i've always done the fold but i'm gonna try to make this one look cool and do the modeling um so go ahead and fold it in half and cut it and then fold it in half again and cut it. Now you're left with eight little short strands of McFly foam. And what you want to do is kind of stack them all uneven. So you've got green on the outside, white on the inside, or tan on the inside. I'm just trying to make it so I don't have two of the same color touching. So when you trim this, it will be cool and modeled looking, at least in theory. All right, so now we got this big old ball of McFly foam. Let's see here, kind of blend it together a little bit like that. Okay, now for anyone who's ever tied an egg, you know what's coming next. All you do, take this big old ball of McFly foam Get it right in the center. Now, this is where I was talking about that those eyes, the mono, is actually going to help us. We set those eyes up so they're right in the center of the fly for this purpose. 
it will keep our McFly foam in the right place and it will make sure our thread goes to the right place. So we're just going to lay that McFly foam down, throw a wrap over it, and make sure our thread drops down between our eyes again. And now pull it down. Didn't get it quite in the middle. Need to go over a little bit. There we go. Now we're in the middle. Pull down very tight. Don't break your thread, but pull down very tight. So, look at that. Doesn't that look like a crab? <laughs> it's got to be the best crab I've ever seen. Best crab in the world. Um, I usually give it about three or four good tight pulls. Give it one more. After you've done that, go ahead and pull your McFly foam up. This is where whip finishing with your hands is a very dire skill. And I like to whip finish right on the same exact line. And that's a nice five turn whip finish. Got it nice and tight. It's the reason I like 210. You can just crank on that thread and you don't have to worry. Let Bob and suck some of that up. All right. The tying portion of the fly is done. Now just the uh, the fun part. The part where you can ruin the whole crab in two seconds. <laughs> um, it's really not that bad. If you've ever tied eggs, you know it's, it's, it's not a huge deal. You just, uh, all we're going to do is we're going to pull up on this material, get it, I mean, get a good grip on it and pull it up like so. I mean, almost bend the hook. You're pulling so hard. And the first time you do this, I always suggest cutting a little higher than you think you can. You should, because you can always trim this stuff when you're done. You can keep trimming it, make it look pretty, but um, be generous with your first cut. Don't, don't cut super close to the body. <laughs> so a good gauge, if you've never done one of these before, you can cut it right in line with the hook point, and it will give you a nice round body. Now, one thing you don't do, do not do a rounded cut. Don't try and do anything fancy. Just cut it straight across. Straight. <laughs> if you round it, it will look awful. Don't do that. <laughs> like I, can, I cannot express it enough. If you try to round it, that's the number one thing everyone screws up with their tying an egg. Don't do a round cut. This stuff is already kind of folded around the hook shank, so it is rounded for you. All you have to do is cut it straight. And we'll get in here. And moment of truth. Bow. Look at that. Ain't she cute? It's a crab. Now, there's always a little bit of fine trimming to do get in here for a second and do some fine trimming with uh, some razor scissors if you got them it makes makes the uh, just makes it a little easier and uh, I do this to get the final kind of round shape and in all honesty like I said earlier in the video this wild fish just fine the way it is you don't need to be picky like I am so uh, you want to answer a couple questions while you trimming? Yeah, while I'm trimming, I'll answer a few. All right, so um, Josh Phillips, uh, Spawn Fly. Uh, I wish we had more crab eaters up here in the uh, in the PNW, Pacific Northwest. Come on down here to the Mid-Atlantic and get all you want. <laughs> Come out. Um, Bring oh, some. Edward, I'm not going to try your last name. Um, nice. Could you use EP fibers to do the body? You can, um, they're not going to have this same dome effect that the McFly crab has. Um, if you were going to use EP fibers, I suggest looking up a Merkin crab or any of those style crab patterns. A Redfish Quan is another one that uses EP. Um, those are more suited for uh, EP fibers. EP doesn't have the, uh, the kind of like bulk I don't even know how to describe it. Like weird, yeah, the sponginess yeah. that this stuff does. 
All right, two more. Uh, fly rotter. Is McFly yarn the same as egg yarn? Similar, yes, but there's a lot of egg yarns on the market that don't do what this stuff does. Um, this stuff is called McFly foam. Like, there should be a package in there that's, all, that's still got the top on it. Um, this is what the package looks like. Uh, this is another color. This is the actual, this is light olive. This was called pale olive. Um, that's what the package looks like. Just regular old McFly foam. It is the, the old egg stuff. I, I don't know. A lot of people like using ecstasy yarn and quick egg and all these other egg materials. The stuff's fine, but this, this stuff is what you need for this crab fly because it's very, very spongy. So when you're pulling it up and forcing all that stretch out of it, when you snip it, it blows back up again and has this nice little dome of a crab shape. And it's just, as you saw when I'm tying this crab, there's nothing hard about tying this crab. It's just a couple steps you need to understand how to do. Once you get those figured out, you're, you're good to go. So you got one more from Fly Rotter and two others that just came in. Okay. Um, no, so from Fly Rotter, ever thought of doing your book with some of your patterns in it? Question mark. Not really, because I don't have enough to fill a book. This is not my pattern. <laughs> um, I guess you could say this one is. I, I don't know. It's, it's just a, uh, it's just, a, that's more of a mashup pattern. I took a bunch of the uh, things I liked about various crab patterns and blended them into one. Um, maybe one day I'll have enough, enough flies to do a book. I doubt it. I just kind of manipulate patterns that already exist for the fish that I've tried to catch. Um, Edward, who you answered earlier, he said, thanks. Crabs are great flies here in Florida. And then uh, Michael Collier, um, have you ever used fabric paint on the bottom fly? Yes. Um, well, not necessarily fabric paint, but um, I have used, God, I can't remember the type of the glue, there is a two-part glue. It's almost like an epoxy that dries kind of a pale beige color, and you can coat the whole bottom of the fly to make it damn near bulletproof. The other, um, the other thing that I'll do sometimes with these is I'll take a piece of furry foam in white or tan or whatever color matches the bottom of the crab, and I'll put a nice glob of like E6000 silicone on top of here and then just smash the... Uh, the, the furry foam right on the bottom. It's called furry foam, but it's foam in the sense that this is foam. It's not like, gonna, it's not going to float the fly. It's just a really, really uh, spongy water absorbent material. And that stuff will, you know, it'll make the fly almost bulletproof. But as I was saying, the reason I like to mix that yarn sometimes, as you can see, you see kind of the mottled effect that the crab body has just more more natural looking most of your crabs that you see have a little bit of uh that modeling to them and it's just the main thing i like about this crab flies it's so clean it's just such a easy body that always comes out i mean just damn near perfect every time covers up all the, the ugliness of the fly it just it's just a fish catcher too um hey rick flink um, he said, hi, Grant and all, just got here when he could. Um, Pescacon Mosca Cosmusel, I don't, I don't know if you said that last part right. Um, he said, nice crab fly, and he wonders if it sinks hook up or down. It will always ride hook up. I, uh, the way this McFly foam is nice, it does absorb water, but on its own, it is buoyant. And then I got the lead eyes on the bottom. So naturally, the buoyant, the more buoyant side of the fly is on top and the lead's on the bottom. Now, the last little piece of tying this fly that there is to do, obviously crabs don't have eyes that stick out an inch from their head. What do you mean? So what you, so what you want to do is, the reason I left those tabs long, is you can get in here with your teeth or with a pair of pliers. And if you did it right, you don't figure eight them super, super tight. You can grab them and slide them into place. And just slide them so that they're 
flush with the edge of the body. Like so. Looking better. See? Now, get in here with some wire cutters or something. This 50 pound mono is not gentle on your scissors. And cut it on the side opposite of the eyes. Um, let's see. Keith Mueller asked, what are the two colors of McFly foam that you were using? This is a uh, just regular McFly foam in tan, and this is what they call pale olive. If you want to tie a cool modeled solid olive fly, like with some lighter olive modeling, I suggest the light olive and then model it with the pale. And it'll give you a cool olive color. I know that's the you know the two main colors of crabs that everybody throws is the uh, olive or the tan. So I know up here pretty much all of our crabs are either a dark or a light tan. Um, in the in the fall you'll see some uh, some pea crabs and some fiddler crabs. They get really really green, but uh, most of the ones that you're seeing running around on the flat. And uh, right on the edge of the water there, they got more tan than anything to them. So that's the color I try to go for the most. Um, Josh said he's got he's got to tie some up. They are a fun fun fly to tie. They're, it's just, I don't know, they're an addicting fly because they always look so good when you make that cut. And all this stuff you're seeing me do now is just me being picky. You don't have to do any of this. Um, Rick Flink, it's a half a layer of blanket. We used to buy the blankets and pull them apart to cut pieces of it to tie with. Talking about the furry foam. Oh, the, um, the, uh, yeah, the furry foam that you can buy in the sheets. Yeah, I got you. Huh, that's cool. David Carl, do you burn the ends of the legs? I'm about to. That's the last thing you really have to do with these. But essentially, you can fish it this way, but uh, burning the end of the leg seals everything up, makes it a little more durable. Just kind of taking the question time to trim the fly up and see if anybody's got any other questions. Any other questions coming in? Yes. No. They were uh, coming in pretty slowly, but uh, we're just uh, giving it a second. All right. So, got those uh, got those eyes in the position I want them now. Got the uh, body nice and trimmed, looking pretty. And as for burning the legs, this is a quick and easy way to mess the crab up. Also, you can trim the legs. I like to leave them a little longer than most people do, but um, I'll get in here and trim them a little bit. And trim this guy off. The scissors are terrible. Um, yeah, I try to kind of use the legs to guide, and uh, your longest leg should be the leg that's in line with the hook eye, like so, and then just try and match it up on each side. Like so. The only legs that shouldn't really match are the claws. It's like I explained, you want to have one arm. They call it like a strong arm of the crab. And I like to always leave that on the side where the eye is. So when I'm moving it, that arm is doing a lot of moving around, basically suggesting a crab in a defensive position. Um, now for the burning of the legs, all you want to do is kind of just kiss the end of this chenille with the flame and it will give it a nice point. A little easy there. See how they're coming out nice and nice and pointed. Do it on the claws too.
There we go. Um, if you want, you can also kind of bar up the claws and stuff like I do on these flexo crabs, the one that I showed earlier. Gives it a kind of cool look. Um, I do usually color the tips of the claws on my crabs, just give them a little dot of red on the tip. Just gives them, I don't know, a little bit more realism. One thing I didn't do was put any glue on the bottom here. So that same tie-in point where we tied all of the uh, McFly foam in, that's where our eyes are secured. It's right next to our lead eyes. You can kind of just goop some... some uh, solar res on there. Maybe even put a little bit on the thread that's exposed under the eyes. So, um, and now you got pretty much a bulletproof little quick and easy crab pattern. You, yeah. you can add a weed guard to this fly too. It's kind of a weird way to do it, but um, I have noticed it, it, it seems to hold fine. If you wanted to take a little, like a couple pieces of 50 pound mono and just basically you take the mono and stick it down into the foam with some uh, Loctite on it, straight vertical like that, it, it seems to work. Uh, it holds in place. I've only had maybe a couple of them pull out, but it, it does what I want to do. It keeps the weeds off the fly, so I can't complain. But, fly rider. Fly Rodder asks, can you get the McFly foam in black for my area? Yes, you can get that McFly foam comes in like every color. Um, I mean, it comes in basically all the colors that Sharpies come in. You, you can get it in any color you could think of. Colin Callbeck said, great job on the, on the crabs. Thank you, um, thank you. Mom said, don't burn my house down. Then Brantley said, and don't set the smoke detector off either. <laughs> I might set the smoke detector off <laughs> just because. But all it's really, I mean, this is, you could sit here for hours trimming these flies just to make them look perfect. But as long as it's nice and pretty and rounded off, it's going to get eaten. They're, they're not going to be super picky. Morgan Oliver, do you even fish, bro? No. <laughs> never. I've literally never seen him with a rod in his hand. <laughs> Ever. It's all a ruse. Just a club, just a clever game. <laughs> he said, "Good looking stuff, man." Thank you, thank you. Alrighty, so best way to kind of see the profile of the crab. There you go. Cute little dude. Like you said, uh, I've got a red sharpie handy here. Take a, one of my chenille cards. And just kind of, you can just tip the claws a little bit. This is just getting picky, more or less. If you just want to give it that little extra something. There we go. Now she got red claws. So that's about all I got. Um, anybody got any questions? Yes, you do. Um, all right. Ted Kassar, how many clumps of McFly foam did you tie in? The video skipped that for some reason. Huh. Okay. Um, what I did, this McFly foam comes in packages like this. I mean, I always keep it. The, you got to store this stuff in the package. If you if you leave it out, it's going to get stuck to everything. Um, it's basically just a long piece of it wrapped around. So if you take a piece out, I like to take a piece of McFly foam from each color that I'm going to use. So like I use the pale olive and the tan. Um, I'll take one length of the package, like so. Um, this is actually two pieces. You'll see when you if you have the material. You'll see how there's that's that's one piece now, the width right there. It's about the width of a pencil. That's what you want. You use one piece, the length of the package, 
from each color, and then you fold it in half twice. So it'll end up being about this long, and it makes eight pieces. Eight, basically eight inch and a half long pieces that you stack together and then pull up and stack. <laughs> um sorry that's right it's buttering out anyway give me a second um clifford souza nice looking fly thank you thank you um i don't know how to say your first name wm claws how would you strip it um this fly i i fish it more the same way like a crab would be swimming around long slow strips of line and then maybe at the end of the strip give it like a wrist flick to kind of make it flutter up a little bit and swim around but for the most part this is more of a sight casting fly when you see fish budding you want to throw something at them while they're feeding that's one of the better flies and uh it's another one it's a good one to throw and kind of plop in front of fish that are cruising. Maybe plop it six to ten feet in front of some fish that are cruising. And if they don't, pounce on it right away. Give it a little flick to get it up in the water column, and they'll see it swimming right there. That's one thing. These A lot of people think these chenille legs don't have a, a lot of action to them. They have a ton of action. When they get wet and they absorb water, they just wiggle like crazy. So when you pop this thing up, these legs are going to be moving in every direction. It's going to look just like a crab trying to swim in the current, and they're just they're going to pounce on it. Um, Stephen Stubb or Stephen Stube. I don't know how to say your last name again. Sorry we are about so that. We are sorry if we butcher your name. <laughs> uh, We're he very said, sorry. Nicely done. Enjoyed your set. Thank you. Um, Chris Cook. That's a nice. That's that's nice. One day I hope to fish the salt. It ain't going anywhere. It's waiting on you. It's addicting. I'll admit, I, I split my time between the snakeheads and the, the reds in the summer, and it's it's hard to choose what to do most days. Um, John Matthews, he said, thanks. As one who fishes crabs here in the low country of South Carolina, I've learned a lot tonight. If you're ever down our way, let's wait and find some reds. I am good with that. Marvin Carl. I come down there every October, actually. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, Marvin Carl, wonder if they wor will work and British Columbia, Canada. If you got little crabs, they will. I, <laughs> I don't know if British Columbia has any crabs, but maybe they do. Um, Terry Landry, he said, are you ready? I'm not sure if I am. Oh, you're referring to March Madness. Yeah. Oh, I, I am so ready. <laughs> Doesn't mean I'm confident, but I'm ready. Um, I was born ready. <laughs> hey, D. Um, D. Norris said, awesome job making and explaining. Thank you. Not a problem. Gunner Cove, very informative. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Not a problem. Fly Rotter, what hook brand and sizes? Uh, sizes is, is that again? And what's the biggest size you have tied for fishing? Um, this is an A Rex Minnow SA280 number one. And in terms of crab flies, this is about as large as I get. Um, when you get much bigger than this, there's been a lot of science done to it. Most of your, most of our cruising reds and our flats reds, they don't eat crabs a whole lot bigger than this until they get big, until they get into the 40-inch range, and then they're eating full-size blue crabs. But um, when they're this size, you basically the reds diet is split between finger mullet, pinfish, basically whatever they can fit in their mouth. But when they're cruising on the flat, they do actively look for crabs and shrimp. This just happens to be the size of most of the crabs we have here in Virginia. A lot of guys down in Florida, like in the Tampa area, the Isla Mirada area, um, various, you know, all the areas all around the all around the Gulf Coast at Everglades, you need to size it to the, the size crabs that you're fishing. I know a bunch of guys in Tampa have to fish small stuff, so you might want to tie it in a size four, a size two, maybe even down to a size six. I know a lot of the guys that bone fish with crab flies and permit fish with crab flies, they tie this same fly, but they'll tie it down to an eight sometimes. And uh, I really, really do like this A-Rex Meadow hook for it. It's a nice stout hook, um, real short shank to give you a nice 
basically the the body doesn't ex or the hook doesn't extend far past the body. It, it's just the perfect little hook for a crab. Even, oh, sorry. No, sorry. Even though it's called the minnow hook, it's they definitely need to uh, put that on the packaging. It could be used for crabs. Um, Patty said, "Great time, thanks." Thank you. Um, Pesca, the rest of it. That he said, "Thanks." <laughs> um, Ramon Zatina, he said, "Nice crabs." Um, Rick Flink, lost you guys. Did you announce the fly? for the week. Also, I can't wait to see the whole session when it gets posted. Uh, yeah, Rink, or Rink, wow. Wow, sorry, Rick. Yes, Rick, oh, yeah. we, uh, the, uh, Tim joined us a little while ago and announced the, uh, the fly category for this, uh, round is Blaine Chocolate, which is awesome. <laughs> yes. I'm very happy about that. Um, Chris Coon, so this color combo is what you would throw in Florida, or that other one you got also which would you throw for like the chesapeake area um in the chesapeake area this is my choice uh modeled where most of the color is tan whether by modeled i mean all the speckling and everything um typically i split my flies between tan and modeled with brown to this color where it's kind of a tan and blue with a little bit of brown and gold blended in and then um, the only other fly that I really throw a lot is black for uh, crab patterns. They they really, really like this pattern, this color, uh, blurple. Black and purple is a very, very, very successful fly for me. But um, I know in various parts of the country, olive is a super, super, super popular crab fly. I tie a lot of crabs in olive, and I've caught fish here on uh, olive flies, but tan is definitely my better color but um like i said earlier if you wanted to tie one in olive i would still use the mcfly foam but i would do the light olive color and then for your modeling i would use the pale olive basically i don't like to use one solid color nothing in nature is a solid color i like to add a little bit of you know just natural blended color to it it, it definitely makes it look a lot better um chris cook excellent job by the way i learned a lot today thank you thank you glad i could help fly rotter really enjoyed the demonstration great job thank you dick glad rochelle. you enjoyed it dick rochelle i got the pot and old bay that wouldn't make much of a meal but it probably would <laughs> <laughs> but it probably would it probably, probably tastes good <laughs> lisa redfish would think so yeah some funny looking crocus. Some funny looking spot tail crocus. <laughs> Rick Flank, yes. I need I need to learn how to tie Blaine's flies. They're a killer. They are an addiction in and of itself and they catch big fish. Yeah. Um, Doug Lindsay. Uh nice crabs tonight. We don't have salt water in the Chicago area. Guess I will have to plan the trip south. Come on. Um, let's see. You'll plan a trip down here, you'll catch some redfish, and then you'll move. <laughs> uh, Michael Collier, enjoyed it. Thanks. Glad you enjoyed it. And uh, a couple people replying to other people. I'm still just trimming this thing, and it looks no different no matter how much I trim it, but I'm just being picky. Trimming. Micro oh, I literally am like little tiny puffs off of the fly. Redfish won't eat it. No. Get that one I part. trimmed it too much. He won't eat it. <laughs> oh, no. All right. We'll um, give it a few more seconds if uh, no more questions come in. Ryan Dudley, are you making lures like figurines? Ryan Dudley. Is that the Ryan Dudley I went to high school with? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Which got, Ryan Dudley go, are you? <laughs> I didn't go to high school with uh, you, so... Uh, no, this is, a, this is a fishable fly. It is a, a fishable... His other mutual friend with you is Hunter Watson, so if you know Hunter, <laughs> see his profile. Uh, I believe that's the Ryan Dudley I went to high school <laughs> with. What's up, dude? <laughs> All right, let's see. 
Um, Julie Mazzaroli. Oh, Julie Landry. Sorry about that. Julie Landry. Go big or go home. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, there you sit with my rod. Um, fly rodder said, do you tie many of Drew's flies? Love both patterns. Drew uh, Chacon? Uh, I think that's who uh, Yeah, from. Yeah, yes. I do. Yes, Chacon. Yeah. I um I specifically like that knucklehead bait fish of his, the one with the uh, thumb strips. I've had a lot of uh a lot of luck on redfish with that. Tie that's a, um, money. Yeah, I, I just tie it. I just use the knucklehead in like the front of a bucktail, like a almost like a murdich. Yeah. And tie a knucklehead, but right before I tie the knucklehead on, tie a rattle, then tie the knucklehead on top, strip that around and it'll even those knuckleheads will sometimes walk for you. Some really cool eats like that. Let's see, um, <laughs> Ryan said, uh, Mom, why? <laughs> <laughs> he said, she said, why? The blue pleather sectional. Oh, my. Oh, uh, Ryan said, yeah, man, I saw your thing said live. And he said, what's up, brother? And then he said, it looks intense. So intense, bro. Too intense. More intense than anything. Um, Can't think of anything less intense. <laughs> not even like losing a musky. <laughs> John Matthews, do you loop knot the fly or tight tight? I like to loop knot these just to give it a uh, little bit extra <laughs> movement. I can't what? get over the sofa. God, look what you did to us. Section. Well, I can't believe you've done this. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I like to loop knot the fly. It gives it a little bit of extra movement. Um, it. I'm not a huge fan of the loop knot, but with these flies where you're just kind of scooting them around, they, you, you know, any little bit of extra wiggle is nice and it, it helps. Uh, Ryan Dudley, he said he didn't realize this was a thing people did. Pretty it dope. is a thing. Pretty dope. It is a very big thing. <laughs> Vote for my fly. <laughs> Vote, Vote for, for my fly in North March Madness in a week, bro. <laughs> bro. <laughs> All of you, please. I okay. need help. Help you, help you homie out. Um, let's see. Andrew Bejold, I don't know if I'm saying your last name right or wrong. Uh, sorry about it. Um, I have a nine foot snipping. I'm scared that will break. Can't imagine a 31 on the kids. If you can help me out there, Grant, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure. I mean, maybe that was tough to text. Uh, maybe retype that question. I'm not exactly <laughs> sure. Maybe word it a little different. I don't know. Um, Terry Landry said, so are you being pushed to beat me by Braden after tonight? You're there for training, aren't you? <laughs> uh, no training, but it's been talked about. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, it hasn't. No, oh, it's... I have no hard feelings at all. I'm glad I got out by you. It was a great time. Braden legitimately is not is not upset in the least. Um, <laughs> Ryan, <laughs> what's the best fly to use to help lift the sofa? <laughs> Bro, what? <laughs> what's the best fly to use to help lift the sofa? <laughs> I don't know. Why? But it's got something to do with the sofa. That doesn't even make sense with the sofa joke, but it's still just the um, fact that they're asking us. Mom said that's not for us. That was for that was replying to Terry. <sighs> Never mind. <laughs> I was confused. <laughs> uh, Doug Lindsay, can you put head cement, some head cement on the body to give it a little crusty shell look? Um, not with this McFly foam. It's just gonna absorb it. Um. With the furry foam stuff, you can, but you, you can't use head cement. You could use like a Solar Res Flex. Um, one of the UV Cure resins would probably work. But this stuff, it just it's just going to absorb it. It's it's not going to really, you're not going to be able to maintain any kind of structure with it. You don't really need to, though, because this stuff, I mean, it is dense. Like you, I mean, I can bend the hook down and can barely cave the body in. When you tie it with those like eight pieces, you trim it. It is dense. Uh, what was it? Replying. Well, it wasn't replying. But she said, no previous complaints. One less thing to worry about. What the heck? Getting done for Wednesday. What was that for? 
Uh-oh. <laughs> I'm actually kind of glad I'm out, because then I don't have to talk lies and portal. <laughs> yeah, true. Um, Fly Rodder, what size lead eyes are those? These are, uh, these are mediums. I, I like to use a little bit more lead. I, I talked about it at the beginning of the video. I like to use a little bit more weight on my crab flies than most people do. It's to, like, I want my flies laying on the bottom. I don't want them fluttering around. The way that we target them here and the way I've caught my most fish cruising, when I see that fish, I want the fly to go to the bottom. He's belly on the bottom as it is. I want the fly to hit the water and be splat right on the bottom in two to three foot of water. So medium lead eyes. I actually will soak this fly in the water first to get this McFly foam saturated. And then once it hits the water, it's just sinks like a rock. And that's, that's what I want. Same thing with my pattern I tied earlier. Um, I want it to sink fast. And um, this one I'll actually throw more at cruising fish too because it will fall through the water column and it'll sit on the bottom for a second before it starts to fall over. And it looks like a crab in a defensive position kind of laying and laying himself down. And those reds love to pick them up as soon as it starts to fall. Uh, my mom called me special. And um, he is, isn't he? <laughs> Andrew said, not anything to do with the fly, but any tips uh, for tying the post on an Adams? Can't seem to make my make make my way up um when i used to tie a bunch of like you mean like a post like for a um, parachute atoms i guess um when i used to tie a lot of parachute flies for uh for like brookies and stuff i used a little bit more material than you probably should just because i, I don't know i found it easier to wrap up um, I also, I don't use much of like the calf tail or whatever they say to use for those posts. I like to use um, the poly yarn. I, I find that stuff works a lot better. And just uh, just take it slow. It's a little weird, you know, pulling your post up and wrapping up this way. It's it's kind of weird to get used to it. This vice helps a lot. Um, if you're if you are tying on a Norvice, when you um, hook your when you start to tie your post, you pull your post up. I actually like to turn it towards me and kind of wrap around it coming at me rather than trying to pull the and like wrap the thread going up it just i think it makes it a little easier you're all good fly rotter um and a couple people reply to other people um give it a few more minutes and if we don't get any more questions should be about it um Real quick, if you already haven't shared the live, um, you only got a few more minutes to do it, but while we're live, if you share it to any anybody um, or whatever. To your regular page. Yeah. Um, oh, man, I totally like, just blanked in my head. Um, Dang. Um, for every 50 <laughs> shares, we're giving away a uh, Norvice Net Gator and Stripping Guards. So we're just going to randomly select someone who shared it, and they will get a... So, pair of Norvice or a Norvice gator and a set of stripping guards. So far, there's 111 shares, so they'll be giving away two prize packages. Um, let's see. Any Michael Collier? Any guides in the area you fish? Um, there are a couple. Um, trying to think. Look up uh, Chesapeake Bay Fly Fishing LLC. That's uh, Chris Newsom. He is the uh, he's the best, without a doubt. Um, he is very 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 good. Chesapeake Bay Fly Fishing LLC. I'm friends with Chris on Facebook. We talk a handful of times, but uh, he is he's the best. I I don't know anybody that catches the amount of fish he does on a fly in the Chesapeake. So, uh, yep. And he books up pretty quick. So uh, yeah. <laughs> once April gets here, definitely need to be booking a date because that guy books up very fast. Terry Landry said, good job, Grant. Good luck this week. It's an honor to be against you. Thanks, man. Same here. Uh, hope to uh, at least give you a little bit of a run for your money. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. I'll, uh, we'll see what happens. Good luck, man. Hope. It's going to be a fun time. I love tying uh, Blaine's flaws, so it's going to be fun either way. 
uh, Doug Lindsay, my Norvice is being livered, delivered Tuesday. Can't wait. Well, you're going to love it. Yep. It's going to be a fun time. It's definitely going to be a learning curve to start off with, but if you just keep at it, you'll get used to it. I mean, it's definitely different than every other vice, but if you take your time with it and get used to it, um, it it's pretty cool. How much can Grant trim before he wants right. to fly? Um, well, it's getting a little late. We got to eat dinner, so... Uh, you got to eat dinner. I'm good. Yeah. Well, we're, we're going to call it tonight, guys. Yep. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. Um, hope you all like the fly, like the live. Yep. If you've um, uh, got any questions, feel free to shoot us a message, you know, if you see this video after it's live, and uh, we'll get back to you. Um, oh, yeah. Um, if you want to follow me on Instagram, I post a ton of the flies I tie, uh, a lot of good fish pictures, if I do say so myself. Uh, <laughs> my uh, Instagram is Grant Alvis underscore fly fanatic. It's uh, fanatic is with an I, not an A, fanatic. So Grant Alvis underscore fly fanatic. It'll, if you type in Grant Alvis, it'll be one of the, one of the ones to come up. So appreciate it, guys. See you next time. Thanks.